In the 19th century, prostitution became such a big issue in America. The Industrial Revolution led to more people moving to cities for jobs and opportunities, but it also brought problems like the growth of the sex industry. At the time, women from different backgrounds ended up in prostitution. Some did it because they were poor and had no other work, while others wanted to escape bad relationships or support their families. Sadly, for many, choosing this path as a way of life ended up leading to their tragic demise. In today's video, we will dive into the tragic life of a prostitute known as Helen Jewett. Helen Jewett was born Dorcas Doyen in Augusta, Maine, in 1813. Her mother died when she was young, while her father was always in and out of bars, drinking himself into a stupor. Due to her situation, she set her mind to working menial jobs, and from the age of 12 or 13, she was employed as a servant girl in the home of a local judge named Nathan Weston. As the years passed, Jewett blossomed into a very beautiful girl whose looks brought her compliments from many people. However, life at the judge's home held no allure for her, even though Weston enrolled her in a school. She wanted more for herself, and upon reaching the age of 18, she left Weston's home to move to Portland, Maine. Here, she found out that making a living was a big issue. She had no special skills, even though she was intelligent. Also, she was now too old for another family to take her in. As a last grasp option, she took to prostitution, hoping to utilize the beauty and charm that men had admired her for as a means to support herself. This lifestyle took Jewett from Portland to Boston, and finally to New York City in search of better prospects. In New York City, she finally assumed the name she'd come to be known by, Helen Jewett. This was after using several aliases in her past locations. Living in this state was where she finally made a name for herself as an employee of one of the countless brothels operating in the city in the 1830s. After working for years as a prostitute, tragedy struck, and Jewett met her demise in 1836, sometime between the late hours of April 9th and the early hours of April 10th. While it was not uncommon at the time for a prostitute to die from the many venerable diseases around, Jewett's death was different. She had been murdered. On the day of her death, Rosina Townsend, the madam of the brothel Jewett was living in, was making her rounds when she noticed an unusual occurrence. A small lamp was burning on a table in the hallway, which she assumed was from either Jewett's room or Maria Stevens, another prostitute living across from Jewett. Just as Townsend was about to pick up the lamp, she noticed that the brothel's back door was wide open. She quickly locked it and picked up the lamp to return it to the owner. She approached Jute's room first, and saw that the door was partly open. Pushing the door ajar, Townsend encountered a shocking scene. The room was billowing with black smoke while flames licked away at a corner of the bed, threatening to consume the entire room. Quickly, Townsend ran outside to scream for help to save her establishment from getting burned down. Soon enough, help arrived, and the fire was put out. But as the smoke cleared from the room, they all saw Jewett lying on the floor with her nightclothes mostly burned. One arm was raised over her head, the other lay over her chest, and the left side of her body was charred from the fire. Upon closer inspection, there was no doubt that Jewett was dead, but not from the fire. Her head was smashed badly, with blood spilling out onto the floor, Quickly, a question arose after the shock of seeing Jewett lying lifeless on the ground. Who was the last person to visit Jewett? A man's name was brought up. According to witnesses, this man had come in earlier that evening to see Jewett while dressed up in a long, dark coat. Moments later, the police were called in, and this information was passed across to them. But before they went ahead to find the man, they inspected the backyard and garden and found a blood-stained hatchet left on the ground. Also found close by was a cloak, similar to the one the man was said to have worn. The man, who was later identified as Richard Robinson, was found at a boarding house within the area. Richard was only 18 years old at the time, and he worked as a clerk for a merchant selling dry goods. Reports have it that he happened to run into Helen Jewett as she was accosted by a ruffian outside a theatre. Robinson had beat up the hoodlum, which impressed Jewett. She then gave him her calling card, leading to multiple clandestine visits by Robinson to the brothel, allegedly including the night of Jewett's murder. When investigators arrived in search of Robinson at the boarding house, they ordered him to get dressed and accompany them to the station house. But instead of taking him to the station, they took him to the brothel, where Jewett's body had been laid on the bed. Robinson was forced to look at her while the investigators observed him. 
He showed no signs of agitation or distress, but rather insisted that he had been home that night, asleep in his bed. He also said that he wouldn't dare wreck his brilliant prospects with such a ridiculous act. However, this did not stop him from getting arrested. As several officers carted him away, others examined the evidence they had found. Besides the cloak and hatchet from the yard, beneath the pillow on Jewett's bed was a man's handkerchief. Its initials did not match those of Richard Robinson. However, witnesses at the brothel insisted that only Robinson was in the room that night. Proceeding with the investigation, the officers picked a coroner's jury of 12 men from the crowd that had gathered to hear the news. With these men, they conducted an inquiry aimed at getting the citizens to agree that an initial indictment should be issued against Robinson. Three pieces of forensic evidence were used in deciding that Robinson should be tried. The first was the left-behind cloak, which was said to be his. The second one was a broken piece of twine attached to a buttonhole in his clothing that appeared to coordinate precisely with the broken twine found on the hatchet handle. Three traces of whitewash were on his trousers, apparently from the backyard fence of the brothel, over which he had presumably climbed to make his escape. The evidence was ultimately deemed sufficient by the jury, and Robinson was then taken to jail to be tried. During the year before Jewett's death, New York City only had seven homicides. This made Jewett's brutal murder delivered by a hatchet a tantalizing story for the press. Lurid descriptions of the murder scenes and the life of Jewett were published, with some blaming her for her predicament and vindicating Robinson. Others claimed that Robinson was guilty, saying that it was not surprising for well-bred people to harbor murderous impulses. The story spread quickly, especially because Helen Jewett was a well-known prostitute who was beautiful and seemed to be educated. Also on people's minds was how Jewett had come into the circumstance of being a prostitute while they waited eagerly for Robinson's trial. Some even trooped to the brothel where Jewett was killed. The mayor of New York was not left out. As all this was happening, two cult-like movements developed among those who were acquainted with the case. The first was a group of young men who began to wear cloaks and caps, just like Robinson was known to do prior to being arrested for allegedly murdering Jewett. This fashion style was to show their solidarity with him and their belief in his innocence. Beyond it being a show of support for Robinson, the men's actions suggested that sexual aggression, entitlement and indulgence were acceptable. They argued that young men shouldn't face threats from prostitutes, whom they considered social leeches. While acknowledging the need for brothels, they believed the women working in them were worthless. In their view, Robinson should be seen as an idol and symbol of sexual freedom rather than a murderer. The second cult-like movement consisted mostly of women who supported Jewett. This category typically wore white beaver caps with a black crepe band. Unlike those defending the accused Robinson, they didn't necessarily defend Jewett's lifestyle, but were not willing to see her killer escape justice. Eventually, a grand jury was convened on the case, which was named People vs. Richard Robinson. They returned a true bill of indictment, upholding the earlier decision of the coroner's jury to try Robinson for murder. All through this time, Robinson continued to maintain that he was innocent to his lawyers and the inmates he met in jail while awaiting his trial. A few days before the trial was set to begin, Marie Stevens, Jewett's colleague and also one of the witnesses who had claimed to have seen a cloaked Robinson in the hallway of the brothel, died. Her death led to the prosecution losing a key witness, which might have affected the eventual outcome of the case. On June 2, 1936, the long-awaited trial finally began. It had been two months since the murder, yet the sensationalism around it had yet to fade. Despite the heavy downpour on that day, a crowd of over 6,000 people gathered outside of the City Hall, where the trial was scheduled to take place in one of its courtrooms. With everyone eager to watch how the trial was going to unfold, the marshals on the ground had to devise a means to make it possible for people to observe the proceedings. They allowed a thousand people at a time into the courtroom for a limited period, then rotated them with another batch. However, this did not stop the overcrowded conditions from delaying the proceedings on multiple occasions. The trial was presided over by Judge Ogden Edwards, a veteran judge who had spent several years on the bench. On the prosecutor's bench were District Attorneys Thomas Phoenix and Robert H. Morris. Phoenix served as the lead lawyer for the people, while Morris served as his assistant. Meanwhile, Robinson had a trio of lawyers, Ogden Hoffman, William Price and Hugh Maxwell, to defend him. 
All three were hired by Robinson's wealthy employer, Joseph Hoxie. It was never known whether Hoxie did this because he believed Robinson, or if he wanted to avoid being stained by association if Robinson was found guilty. However, what was clear was that many members of the public felt the prosecutors did not stand a chance against the defense team. It was well known that the defense consisted of skilled orators and debaters, the chief of whom had been a district attorney. When the time for jury selection came, it took five long hours of thorough cross-examination by the defense and the prosecutors. Both of them tried to outmaneuver each other, doing their best to choose faces that appealed to their side from among the 29 citizens who showed up. All through the process of selection, Robinson was required to remain on his feet as per protocol. Reports have it that he had a composed look on his face all through, as if he were not on trial for one count of willful and deliberate murder. The first witness to be eventually called was Townsend, who served as one of the principal witnesses. As she testified in court, she recalled that Robinson came to the brothel around 9.30 on the day of the murder and went right ahead to Jewett's room. She also claimed that an hour and a half after Robinson's arrival, she took champagne upstairs to Jewett's room and saw Robinson in bed with his head on his arm and his face against the wall. Moving on with her testimony, Townsend claimed that she dropped the champagne and returned to her room. She then recounted how she had been on her usual rounds when she found the back door of the brothel open and a lamp from Jewett's room on the table downstairs. Concluding her tale, Townsend said she opened Jewett's door and saw the burning bed, which eventually led to Jewett's body being discovered after the fire was put out. Meanwhile, police investigators provided details about the crime scene, the house's layout, and the discoveries in the backyard. A porter from Robinson's workplace identified the hatchet as the one he consistently used at the store. It had reportedly gone missing on the day after Jewett's lifeless body was found. The porter also recognized the broken twine associated with the crime. As the trial heated up, a particular piece of evidence became heavily disputed between the prosecutors and the defense. The evidence in question was the diaries of Robinson that were discovered in the boarding house during the investigation. The diaries, whose content had already leaked out to the public, contained multiple sordid tales that hinted at Robinson having a depraved mind, being egotistical and being arrogant. The prosecutors were hoping to use it as proof that Robinson had the capacity to commit the murder, thereby further strengthening witnesses' accounts of seeing him on that night. However, the judge ended up not allowing the diaries to be admitted as evidence because they were not certified as having been written by Robinson. Shortly after, another blow came to the prosecution's case. This time, the judge rejected most of the correspondence shared between Jewett and Robinson over the course of their clandestine meetings. Only one letter was allowed, and it ended up being insufficient to serve as a trail of intention. As the prosecution's case weakened, the defense vigorously worked to reinterpret all the circumstantial evidence. They argued that the handkerchief found under Jewett's pillow indicated that Robinson wasn't the only person in her room that night. The defense also presented a witness who served as an alibi, stating that Robinson had been in his store that evening, smoking cigars and reading. Meanwhile, the alleged whitewash stain on Robinson's trousers was claimed to be paint stains he got from his workplace rather than from the brothel's fence. As for the hatchet that killed Jewett, a manufacturer testified on behalf of the defense that around 2,500 of the same model had been sold in New York City. This was to show that any of the hatchets could have been used in the murder, apart from the one missing from Robinson's place of work. It took about five days before all testimonies were heard, each day raising anticipation about what the verdict could be. On the final day, the defense gave their closing summary, using it as a final act to nullify the foundation of the prosecutor's case. They went all out to discredit Townsend, claiming that all her testimony was not the real tale of the murder night. Additionally, they argued that brothels are often known as havens of deception and corruption among women. On the other hand, the defense spent their closing summary summarizing the evidence against Robinson. They referred to him as a monster and a vampire who had killed a woman to prevent her from exposing his shameful secrets. The trial on the final day continued until nearly midnight. During the closing moments, the judge delivered a final remark to the jury that strongly hinted at the likely verdict. He emphasized with examples that the prosecution hadn't proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt. He also cast doubt on the credibility of prostitutes, citing the nature of their profession. Unsurprisingly, 
The jury didn't bother asking to be allowed to go home and return the next day to give a verdict. That very night they deliberated and returned less than half an hour later with a unanimous decision that Robinson was not guilty of killing Jewett. The decision led to cheers from many of the spectators, some of whom were members of Robinson's cult following. As for the Jewett sympathizers, they were shell-shocked about how the case turned out. Meanwhile, the very instant the verdict was read out, Robinson began to cry heavily. His months-long stay in jail had finally come to an end and he was free to go as he pleased. However, despite being a free man, he did not stay in the city for long. Perhaps due to the attention of the case or possible guilt, he left New York City and headed to Texas. In a shocking turn of events, Robinson died two years later. While on a steamboat, he contracted a fever and had to be taken off to a hotel. In his delirium prior to his death, he reportedly repeated the name Helen Jewett. No other person was eventually apprehended in connection with Jewett's murder. Her case became a cold one that only came up as gossip within the city in the months after her death. However, the following year a trend started that has endured to the present day. First, a newspaper that published a front-page article about rising murders in New York City claimed that the acquittal of Robinson may have inspired other murders. In the years that followed, the murder continued to resurface in the city's newspapers, particularly when someone connected to the case passed away, or when a similar type of murder occurred. This established a pattern in how crime stories were told to readers. Reporters and editors had finally recognized that sensationalized narratives of high-profile crimes boosted newspaper sales. With this, there was simply no turning back to the old ways.